Many years ago, we were having a discussion about this sort of thing rather informally, and I noticed at one time that I had um, sat in a room where I had a white wall getting indirect lighting. And just for the fun of it, I would close one eye and look at the wall and then close the other eye and look at the wall to see if I noticed a shift in color, and lo and behold, I did. So out of my left eye, there was a barely perceptible bluish tint to that white wall. And when I looked out of my right eye, it was more of a reddish tint. Now, I don't know if this is uh, uh, symptomatic of a large part of the population, but just the fact that two, two different eyes from the same person can perceive a slight color shift with, let's say, indirect light reflected off a white surface. Well, again, this gets back to what we said earlier about there's a lot of randomness in how we view things. And I wasn't kidding when I said, you know, you can't trust your eyes when it comes to displays. So now we're going to go in a totally different direction. We're going to talk about black level visibility as a function of the ambient surround. So again, we're going to be dealing with ambient surround, but now it's people's perception of what we call black level, or more accurately, very, very low levels of gray. And this is very important, uh, especially with high dynamic range. Um, earlier in the day, in one of the HDR sessions, uh, we were kind of discussing the fact that it's a lot easier to get to a much brighter white, but what about all that stuff that's in the shadows? Will HDR actually improve our ability to see that? So we have two presenters that are going to talk about this topic of the effect of the ambient surround and black level illumination, Scott Daly who is from Dolby Labs. Uh, he got his BSEE from North Carolina State, Wolfpack guy, 1980, an MS in bioengineering from University of Utah. He was engaged in retinal neurophysiology. And he spent some time at Sharp Labs in Camas, where he led a group on display algorithms and became a research fellow and leader for the Center of Display Appearance. So he's been working on this for quite a while. Um, he joined Dolby in 2010 to focus on overall fundamental perceptual issues and toward applications whose aim is to preserve artistic intent throughout the entire video path for each reviewer. Good luck with that. He's a member of IEEE, SPIE, and SID. Robert, uh, is it one not? Oh. Uh, from uh, West Pomeranian University, uh, Siachen. He has a Master of Science Computer Science and a PhD in Computer Graphics, and he works as a senior color scientist for Dolby. His research interests include visual perception modeling, low light color reproduction, and predicting the effect of viewing conditions on image appearance. So without further ado, we will begin. We will learn about black level visibility as a function of ambient illumination. Yeah, thanks, Pete. Oh, so yeah, I should uh, mention. So in addition to uh, Rob, um, uh, another collaborator was Timo Kunkel, also from Dolby, and then uh, Pavel. Korshinov and uh, Taraj Ibrahimi, uh, both from uh, EPFL in Switzerland. Uh, so this simple diagram uh, basically shows uh, a viewer looking at a display in a room with uh, illumination. And um, <clears throat> there are three key effects of ambient light on the perceived image. And we'll focus on the achromatic, uh, so as opposed to the previous talk, which did a great job on the chromatic aspects. Uh, so there's a uh, light adaptation, uh, screen reflections, and the uh, effect of the surround. And <clears throat> so for light adaptation, uh, we have light entering the viewer's eye um, from uh, the display itself, that, that's the main subject of interest, uh, from the uh, light sources, if the uh, viewer's uh, attention wanders and may actually look at a light source, as well, and then uh, in addition, the uh, uh, surrounding objects in the room. Uh, so the light's basically coming from all these three places, which combine to affect the light adaptation level. The uh, second key effect is screen reflections. So here we have light uh, from the light sources and uh, from the uh, walls and floor of the room, reflecting secondary reflections reflecting onto the display and then back into the viewer's eye. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, actual uh, Details of that uh, reflection back to the viewer's eye will be dependent on the uh, screen reflectivity and uh, the geometry that is uh, described with the BRDF uh, function. Um, and then the last uh, key effect of ambient is the uh, surround. So here it's the region in the field of view that is uh, basically sur uh, surrounding the display of interest. <clears throat> so of, of these three key effects, we're going to focus on the uh, surround effect with a psychophysical study. Uh, our motivation for starting with the surround effect was that um, 
with large, with the displays being larger, um, the effect of uh, the display tends to dominate uh, over the other conditions, unless the room is very bright. Um, and then for the uh, display reflectivity issue, uh, that's mostly a physics problem that can be modeled and, and requires uh, uh, sensors on the TV and things like that. Uh, so, but we felt what was the part least understood was the effect of the surround, so that's what we wanted to study. And we are mostly, uh, the main motivating question was what black level was needed for displays under these uh, varying conditions. <clears throat> so we're kind of looking at the black level as well as uh, shadow detail visibility. So we need to move from psychophysics, or sorry, from the physics to the psychophysics. And I'll just mention a few primer type stuff. Uh, so we basically have the concept of a detection threshold. So this is the lowest modulation in a given dimension uh, that a human can perceive. And this dimension would be any dimension in imagery. It could be a luminance a dimension or a temporal or a color, for example. And generally you think of, uh, uh, you take one of these dimensions, you st uh, start with zero and then you increase it until the observer can see a difference. So that's the threshold. And another common term is uh, J and D, or just noticeable difference. So in our particular case, uh, the dimension we're interested in is uh, luminance. And uh, these uh, thresholds also change with the luminance. Um, and we'll be looking at that. <clears throat> in vision science, uh, signal contrast is typically used to describe the stimuli um, uh, of these modulations. And there's three types shown here. Uh, Weber contrast is the oldest, uh, d dating back to very traditional psychophysics, um, and it generally involves a step edge, and you have it's described as delta L over L. Um, another uh, more recent one that came about when people started studying sine waves was uh, Michelson contrast. And uh, lastly, uh, more recently, people started using RMS contrast to basically study the perception of noise field. And then people realized that you could also use this for not only noise, but for textures, and then even for images in general. Uh, so a quick little uh, a reminder of JND. So this will be an example for a step edge in luminance. So um, on the right, we have a rectangular patch uh, that's split in two, um, and the luminances of each patch is shown on the left with the axis indicating luminance. In, uh, in this particular slide, uh, luminance one and luminance two are exactly equal, and then as you'd expect, they look exactly equal. Um, however, if we start increasing the luminance of, uh, of uh, the right side, luminance two, um, we can actually move it up quite a bit, or a certain amount of luminance, and yet you still don't see a difference um, in the rectangular region to the right. So here you have uh, different physical luminances, but perceptually they're the same. And then if you increase that further, uh, then you actually exceed the uh, range of the JND, and uh, now it becomes visible. So now we have the two phys physically different uh, regions that appear physically different, and uh, we basically have surpassed the perceptual threshold. Um, <clears throat> So I need to go into a little bit of detail on spatial uh, detection basics. So on the left is a classical uh, experiment. These are often referred to as TVI, which is threshold versus intensity. Um, they're typically uh, disks or rectangular patches, uh, uh, basically superimposed on other similar uh, regions. And then the luminance of one or the other are adjusted to uh, basically find the particular thresholds. Um, so um, the problem, well, one of the problems with these is that both with the disk type stimuli and the rectangular patches, the detection is dominated by the power spectrum of the edge of the stimulus. Um, and it's, uh, been it's been known now that the step edges are not the best probe of the visual system's behavior, that you can actually see smaller amplitudes uh, for sine waves than for step uh, functions. Uh, the data to the right is some pretty old stuff from Campbell and Robson, some of the early experimenters with sine waves, and they were basically comparing square waves and sine waves. The vertical axis is contrast sensitivity. That's the inverse of the threshold. Uh, you can think of it as a gain. So the higher up you go on the vertical axis, the smaller signals you can see. The uh, horizontal axis is the spatial frequency in cycles per degree, and that's a log axis as well. Um, so the blue curve is the square waves and the green is the sine waves. And you can see that for the high frequencies, in fact, frequencies greater than one, that um, 
the, so frequency is greater than one. They, the curves superimpose, they have ba basically the same behavior. And there's a slight offset. Um, and this basically means the square wave and sine waves appear the same. Um, you can plot the ratio of these two and you actually get this steady line coming out at four over pi. And that's exactly what you'd expect from Fourier analysis of a square wave versus a sine wave, um, if assu assuming the detection is being done by the fundamental frequency of, uh, of each of those. Um, so that's kind of a nice uh, uh, mathematical result that we find in human vision. But uh, going back to the problems with these type of stimuli, um, if you take a square wave and you lower and lower the frequency, you can see that it asymptotes here, whereas the sine wave, the sensitivity keeps going down. What's happening here is that you're really, even though you're lowering the frequency of the square wave, you're still looking at the same thing. You're basically looking at the square wave's edge. So you're, you can think of this response here as being the response to an edge, and that's why it uh, doesn't change. And then you can look at this and see that easily with sine waves, you can see up three times or four times uh, better than you can with these edge-type stimuli. So. Um, Further work's been done, this is from the early 80s, where they did an exhaustive search of spatial patterns to find out what the human visual system was the most sensitive to. Um, and they basically um, also took into account the size of the stimuli itself. So obviously a bigger stimuli is easier to see than a smaller one. And they found that the one that basically gives you the best uh, sensitivity um, under a constraint of contrast energy is a Gabor stimuli, which is a sine wave with a uh, Gaussian envelope. Um, and that, ba that basically result hasn't uh, been changed uh, since. Uh, so we're going to use that stimuli to investigate the effects of surround. And uh, the experiment, some of the experiment details are shown here. So we use the Pulsar and HDR display. We used a one dimension, or sorry, a 1.0 neutral density filter placed over the display so that we could get an even blower, lower black level. So we basically, uh, wanted to make sure that the uh, visual system was the limit of perception on the uh, dark end as opposed to the display itself. We studied uh, five surrounds ranging from 0.4 to 100, uh, all in candles per square meter. Um, the viewer doesn't see the light source at all, and th the geometry of the room is also just set up so that no direct uh, incident light uh, hit, hit the display surface. So uh, these, this tying back to the three effects I mentioned at the very beginning, this is kind of relating to the light adaptation, possible contamination, and this relates to the display reflectivity. So we're basically pulling out those variables out of the experiment. And a um, little bit more details, uh, some of the pulsar details are shown here. So we're basically controlling the surround, and then for each surround that we study of these, we also vary the image mean. Uh, and then you can, if you're sitting in the front half, you can see the Gabor pattern here. It spanned five degrees. We used a three picture height viewing distance. So that meant the display spanned 35 degrees. And um, so the surround luminance was the key variable. And for that, for each surround, we changed the image mean levels. I mentioned we had uh, 25 subjects. Uh, this slide goes into a little bit more details on the stimulus. Uh, so we used the Gabor, as I mentioned, and we had it, the fundamental frequency was one cycle per degree, and it spanned five degrees. And then, uh, and then so for each surround, we found the threshold as a function of the gray level of the mean level. So this is, so basically these are the different image means that we studied, and then for each one of these, we varied the amplitude of the Gabor to, uh, to find the threshold. And for that step, uh, we used uh, two alternative force choice, and the subject's task was basically to pick whether the left half or the right half of the image had the, uh, the display had the Gabor uh, stimulus, or they could even just look to see which one didn't look uniform in case they really couldn't recognize the Gabor itself. And with that, uh, we have the results. So I'll let Rob take over. Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, can everybody hear me? So uh, there you can see the results of the experiment that Scott just described on the right side of this um, uh, of this slide. So each different colored line represents a different surround luminance. So uh, these lines uh, were each measured along uh, several different mean luminance levels, and those are represented along the x-axis. So each of the observers 
adjusted the, the, uh, the detection threshold until we reached converged upon a 75% detection threshold. Then we averaged for all of the observers and we arrived at those plots. So you can think about those lines as, uh, so the detection threshold, the way it's represented over here is delta L. So uh, the amplitude of luminance that had to be added as a Gabor patch until it became visible. So um, what you can see, how you can interpret those curves is that they split the contrast space into two separate regions. And one of these, the region above each of the curves represents all of the contrast values which are going to be perceivable for an average observer who is viewing the contrast at that specific mean luminance along the x-axis for that specific uh, surround luminance which is indicated by the color. And anything below that value is contrast which is not going to be perceivable for an average observer. So one of the things that we can notice immediately is that uh, detection thresholds increase with increasing mean luminance. This is something, this is a factor that we already knew about. This is well-known fact, and it's actually been presented by Weber's law, which says that above a certain luminance, the detection threshold is contrast, it is constant with relative luminance, relative to luminance. So basically, if we increase the luminance 10 times, we need to increase the detection thresholds 10 times. And this means that uh, on a log-log plot, like, oh, sorry. on the log-log plot, like we can see over here, it's gonna have a slope of one. And we can see that the curves slowly converge on that for high luminance levels, which basically proves that point. Another thing that you can notice is that the surround increases the threshold. But uh, what's more important is that the incre increment in the detection threshold is higher for low luminance contrast than for high luminance contrast. So details in the shadow, detail in the dark low luminance areas are going to be more affected by uh, surround light than details in bright areas. And this is something that we can think about intuitively. It's co uh, cohesive with our everyday experience where uh, if we are using our mobile devices outdoors in a bright environment, if the device is showing some bright content, we're gonna be seeing everything quite clearly. However, if we are trying to show a dim image, we are not going to be seeing anything. And part of it is because of the screen reflections, but even if we remove the screen reflections, there's going to be some perceptual crushing happening because of the human visual system raising those thresholds as a result of the surround. So these results are also consistent with a previous experiment done in 2010 by Mantuk and others. And uh, the difference that we see between our results and their results is because Mantuk used a step edge, which as Scott mentioned is the human visual system is less attuned to. They arrived at higher uh, detection thresholds than ours, but other than that, the shape is very similar. Now, if you look at the way we conducted our experiment, you can see some similarities between the way this is done and the way the plus adjustment is done in, in the real world. So a, a plus adjustment is specifically conducted to match the appearance of, a, to improve the appearance on, of a display in a given uh, display viewing environment. So in this case, a skilled technician is going to show an image con, uh, containing some contrast pattern on, uh, on the screen and then manually adjust the uh, mean luminance of the image until all of the contrast in that image is visible. And this could be thought as a very quick way of adjusting the contrast, uh, the detection thresholds by shifting not the detection thresholds themselves up and down like we did in our experiment, but from left to right by adjusting the mean luminance until we cross that detection threshold. Well, in reality, the Pluge adjustment is conducted in the um, in gamma domain, so it's not really just shifting it left and right because we are scaling the contrast and the mean luminance at the same time. But still, um, the differences between Pluge and what we have done in the experiment can be easily explained by the fact that Pluge is not trying to determine any basic uh, inner workings of the human visual system. It's just a quick way of adjusting the image for a specific viewing scenario and running the full experiment like ours in, uh, in field work. It, it would be just two time uh, time-consuming. So after we have analyzed our data, we decided to also take a look if we can actually predict that data. And we found this model from 1973. Uh, there was a data set uh, measured by Rogers and Carroll for, um, for the military. 
And there was also a model fitted to their data set by Barton in 2001 paper. So basically, this model created by Barton takes uh, two inputs or uh, two parameters. The first parameter is the size of the display. So this is expressed in uh, visual degree squared. So for example, uh, we can measure the influence at third, all the way from 30 by 30 degrees, which is a typical viewing size for a full HD display, all the way down to 0 0.5 times 0 0.5, which is a very small sample. And the over input is the ratio of the surround luminance to the, um, to the pattern luminance. And the output of this whole, uh, of the model is a sensitivity scalar. So uh, sensitivity is reciprocal to detection threshold. So as the sensitivity of the human visual system increases, the detection thresholds uh, decrease and vice versa. A decrease in detection threshold is an increase in sensitivity. So uh, what we can see is that the model very well predicts the, uh, what's called the uh, Widow's crispening effect. So crispening effect says that the thresholds are lowest when the surround equals the signal mean. And this is actually true when the ratio of the ambient and the pattern luminance are equal to one, so they are matched, we see that the uh, uh, sensitivity is scaled by one, so it is at its highest, which means that the detection thresholds are at the lowest. Uh, this is not true for smaller patches or for smaller display sizes, which means that small displays uh, do not drive our adaptation, do not drive our adaptation well enough. This data can also be uh, shown in a different way where rather than scaling the sensitivity, we are scaling, uh, scaling the detection thresholds. And this is done over here on this plot. This is exactly the same plot, exactly the same dat data. It's just that the inverse, we are showing the inverse. And also, additionally, we are showing it on the log 10 plot because the uh, function is asymptote towards 0, so the inverse would be very large otherwise. So if we remove the part which is typically not useful for typical viewing conditions, so the surround, which is lower than the display, so it's not going to affect our perception all that much, then we can simply plug in several parameters, which is the mean luminance of the image. We can plug in the, um, the size of the display and the surround luminance. And out of that information, we can get the adjustment of the threshold, which is going to tell us how much do we need to increase the threshold until we can see the differences. And we show the comparison of the results that we got originally from the original uh, study on the left with those same results superposed by the predictions of the model. And as you can see, the predictions of the model fit it very well. You might be thinking that it's fitting it too well, in which case you would be correct, because we actually had to ship those results by 0 0.5 in uh, log 10 domain, which amounts to scaling by 3.5. And the reason why we are doing this is because uh, it can be explained in the same way why there was a mismatch between our results and results from the previous study by Mantuk. It's just that Rogers and Carroll used a different kind of stimulus and a different kind of experimental design than ours. But other than that, the data can be well predicted after we include that constant scaling. So uh, to show some conclusions, we uh, studied the black level visibility using Gabor patches, and we showed that for Gabor patches, we can actually attain a higher sensitivity than for other types of patches, such as disks, patches, and pluge. We showed that the um, increasing the surround luminance uh, has a constant effect of raising all thresholds. However, some thresholds for low luminance levels are going to be raised more than the thresholds for high luminance levels. We uh, showed that we can still see significant detail even below 0 0.001 nits if we are viewing the content on a, a large enough display and in a very dark environment. And even in a standard reference environment at five nits, we are still seeing det detail below 0 0.01 nits. So, uh, and we expect that this is going to improve for fields of vision larger than 35 degrees. Uh, we also uh, found that the model based on Rogers and Carroll data can predict our essential results, which is very useful because now we can expand it to multiple different screens and multiple different conditions rather than just the ones that we measured. Now, the last thing that I'm going to uh, stress out over here is that it is important not to confuse the black level visibility that we have studied with the preference for the black level. Because when we are talking about the black level, we can be talking about two different things or two different criteria for choosing a black level. The first one is the entropy uh, criterion. And the entropy criterion tells us that there's no point in reducing the black level if we cannot show any more detail in that area, which is something that we can pr uh, predict with our model if the details are visible or not. But there's also the sensation criterion, which some people prefer, which is saying that 
we want the black level to look like there's absolutely zero light emitted from an area. We want to have a black silhouette. This could be a creative choice. This could be something, a matter of preference. So this is something that our model does not predict. It doesn't say how the black level is gonna look. All it says is whether we can see the detail over there or not. So uh, currently, we are only accounting for the surround effect. In the future, we are uh, also thinking about in including the uh, display reflectivity. So that needs to be modeled and verified. We're thinking about uh, applying different processing on the adaptation to the room environment so that we can predict. Typically, room are, rooms are not uniformly illuminated, so we need to model that as well. And finally, we also plan to use a better adaptation model based on the scene content. So for example, the model by Van Gorp and Mantuk from 2015 is a very good such model. And that's it. For the interest in, interested viewers, there's a list of papers that study the similar effect, and um, those are a good read if you're really interested in the subject. And having said that, I think we're done. We should have some time for the questions. We have, again, microphone, and uh, just step up, say your name, and, um, and go ahead and ask your questions. Uh, yes, uh, Gary Gornick, CBC. Question for you. For uh, the results that you're showing where you were using um, non-informed viewers, uh, have you ever done the same tests but with uh, professional viewers, like uh, for instance the colorists that uh, I was listening to earlier and, and uh, like uh, people where to see if they are more sensitive or attuned to the control changes that you're doing to, to give the same type of results? Yeah, I think I'll take this one. Yeah, go for it. Uh, so, so these uh, were students at EPFL. Um, so they, they can see fairly well because they're young. They don't have a lot of internal noise building up with age. Uh, but they weren't experts. Uh, but there was a related study done in the 90s with radiologists, so another type of image experts. And they measured the CSFs, the basic frequency response of radiologists compared to uh, non-experts. And it turned out the radiologists performed no better, um, whereas in more advanced tasks uh, in diagnosis and some of the things they have to do with texture changes, they easily outperform the non-experts. So we, our extrapolation of that experiment to this is that because we're looking at very fundamental signals, we don't expect that the experts would do uh, any better than the non-experts. What makes someone an expert is more advanced cognitive aspects of looking at things. Maybe when you get into issues like color memory, there would be a difference for very fundamental signals. But that's a good point, and uh, would, um, you know, I would say if we, had, if we did the experiment in Dolby, then we could did, you know, separate out our non-experts and experts and, and get a better idea of that question. But um, so for right now, that just demand, to really answer your question demands another experiment. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, that, so what happens with age is your internal visual noise builds up. Oh, so the question was about um, uh, looking at the variable of age. Uh, would that have a strong effect on the data? Um, so um, younger people are known to have better sensitivity uh, than, um, than as you get older because your internal uh, neural noise builds up. Um, so yeah, we we're kind of our motivation was to kind of look at um, worst case engineering or best case visual system, but it would be useful to have uh, basic uh, a r understanding of the amount of uh, loss of sensitivity with uh, age. And there there is some data on that. I just don't know the trends off the top of my head. Hi, Marcelo Bertolmio, UPF. So, would you expect? Um, a different outcome if you test it on natural images? <laughs> um, so this is kind of the worst, ca you know, basically worst case scenario. Yeah. Uh, so with natural images, you'll have more masking, um, but there, there'll always be an image with a large uniform area. Yeah. Um, so it basically, it starts to get into an issue of how do you account for image statistics uh, along with the visual system uh, understanding. 
So one approach to dealing with image statistics is to look at the worst cases or corner cases. So, and our data would be directly applicable to that. Um, other approaches are, in, say you're in a less uh, high quality scenario, then you may want to basically lower your quality according to the image statistics. Okay, thank you. All right, doesn't look like we have any more questions. Thank you very much, an excellent presentation. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please tap the like button and also subscribe to our channel to receive notifications when we add new content. For more information about us, please visit simpty.org. We'll see you next time.